Greetings, guitar engineers. I'm Desi Serna, and in this video, I am going to answer some of your questions. I recently sent out an email saying that I'd like to have a uh, Q&A video and podcast episode, and I asked you to submit your questions. So I printed out all of the questions that I received, and I'm going to go through them one by one. He had lots of good questions about guitar playing and practicing and learning songs and music theory and some gear questions and all sorts of interesting stuff. So I'm going to cover a lot of, a lot of ground here. So uh, let's dive in. Actually, before we dive in, I'll explain that I'm also going to release this audio. I'm going to strip it from the video when I'm done, and I'll put it uh, out as a podcast episode. So you can go to wherever you listen to podcast episodes, and you can search for Guitar Music Theory or Desi Serna, and you can listen to my podcast episode. That way you can listen to the audio like while you're on the go or something. I have one of the most popular guitar podcasts um, available. So if you're not already listening to that, go check it out. Likewise, if you're listening to the podcast episode, but you have not uh, subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can go over to the YouTube channel and you can watch my videos as well. All right. So let's get started. Here is question number one from David. And he says that he would like to suggest that I talk about rhythm guitar techniques such as chord voicings, uh, muting and vibrato, and he would also like an overview of modes and how to use them. Okay, so this is a very general um, question here, and you're kind of just suggest suggesting a topic. Um, so I would say that uh, um, if you want to learn more about rhythm guitar techniques, and I'm assuming that maybe you're kind of still on that beginner stage, um, you know that I have some courses that I sell where I, w I show you how to develop the skills needed to play complete songs and that sort of thing. That's what I would recommend. Um, I keep those lessons pretty simple so you can focus on fundamental skills because when you're talking about rhythm guitar skills, usually what happens is people get tripped up when something is a little too difficult or something involves a technique that is just beyond the skills that they have developed. So you always need to kind of back up, work on those um, fundamental techniques and timing. Then you can gradually, by playing songs that are simple and can be played with some, uh, you know, just a handful of uh, basic chords and a, a simple strum pattern. And then you learn lots of those songs and then you gradually work on uh, songs that are a little bit more challenging and a little bit more uh, challenging. Um, and then in terms of like, you know, muting, um, chord voicings and that sort of thing. Again, you can get introduced to those techniques gradually. I introduce those things gradually in the, uh, the song learning courses that I sell. You know, vibrato, um, when you're ready for lead guitar, you can start working on that, but don't get ahead of yourself. If you can't play complete songs, you know, using basic chords and stuff, then you don't need to worry about your vibrato uh, just yet. Overview of modes and how to use them. So I actually received this question several times. It's a very common question because everyone is always everyone is very intrigued by uh, uh, modes. I cover modes extensively in. Uh, my fretboard theory uh, series. I got a whole video series. You could also ju just get the books um, on Amazon. But in the video portion of fretboard theory, I have what is the most comprehensive, simplest, easiest to understand lesson on modes. And I play tons of snippets of popular songs so you connect it all to something familiar. So I'm, a, I'm not going to get into all those details now because I have covered that at length. I actually just uploaded, uh, excuse me, uh, updated that instruction uh, last year. I believe it is the best in, uh, instruction you can get on modes. I guarantee it if it's not. If you've purchased that uh, instruction and uh, you don't think that, that, that it works for you, doesn't make sense, I will give you a refund. No one has complained about it yet. In fact, one of the things I, the most common uh, uh, comment I get about fretboard theory is that it finally de demystified modes and people understood it and could apply it easily and stuff. So check out uh, fretboard theory. Okay, moving on, Tim asks, how he can play better harmonics on and on guitar. Um, well, if uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, harmonics, there are certain. I don't want to get into all the physics because I don't 
I'm not an expert on it, but there are certain nodes on a string, and there are, there are uh, places where you can touch a string, and you can chime a harmonic without physically fretting the notes. Here are the strings open, and then there are some harmonics at the 12th fret. And what I'm doing is I'm just lightly touching the string directly over the metal band that is the 12th fret. I'm not pressing the string down, I'm just lightly touching it. I'm not in this 12th, I'm not in the space, I'm right over the fret. And you can do this um, at the 7th fret. And you can do this at the 5th fret. And sometimes you just have to figure out where do you need to be exactly to get those harmonics to, um, to ring clearly. You just have to move a little bit, but they're going to be over the actual frets. Uh, 5, 7, and 12 are the, uh, the most common. And you hear guitar players use harmonics sometimes in music, you know, like Led Zeppelin and Dazed and Confused, you know. Twelfth fret, and then I think he goes to, does he go to fifth fret? Uh, or, you know, Rush. Uh, there we go. Red Barchetta, and there's, there's many more. So, um, yeah, I would say work on uh, lightly touching those strings directly over the fret. That's where you're going to get your harmonics. Next question, what do I need to know about soloing with respect to chord progressions? For example, a 1-4-5 progression are the rules to switching, transitioning to scales associated with the progression, and what about key changes and the effect of soloing? Okay, um, I cover this at length in my fretboard theory, guitar theory program. <clears throat> I'm going to be referencing a lot of uh, the courses that I have for sale because that's why I created these courses to answer questions like this and to give you the instruction you need. So this is covered in uh, <clears throat> fretboard theory. You could start in chapter two with the pentatonic scale. I talk about learning those patterns and how you apply them to music. Then later I introduce major scale patterns in chapter five and I talk about how you would apply those to music. Then there's actually a chapter uh, dedicated to different ways that you can uh, apply those scales together. Um, then of course I introduce modes and, the ch and the, in Fretboard Theory Volume 2, we get into harmonic minor and some little, little bit more advanced things. And uh, I don't introduce all of this at, all at once. You're not going to find one chapter where I tell you everything you need to know about soloing or applying scales because I, wa because I want it to be a system that can help you understand how popular music is composed on the whole and develop all the playing skills uh, needed. So uh, you get introduced to, you know, small pieces at a time. And then as you progress through the system, you start putting more and more of those pieces together. And that's one of the reasons why people like it so much, because um, I, I show you uh, those necessary things that you need to know to play uh, popular styles of music. I leave out a lot of stuff that's just not useful. Um, and I show you how to put those pieces together. All right, so um, that's where you're going to get your uh, uh, your most your best answer. But uh, short answer, as a general rule, when you're pick choosing scales to solo over a particular progression, the first thing you want to do is identify the main chord in a progression. Right. So if you got something like you know. That's G, C, D, C. I've got three major chords there, but everything starts and ends and resolves on the G. And so G is the main chord in the progression. It's G major. So you could play the G major pentatonic over the whole progression, regardless of what uh, the other chords are, generally speaking, right? So. Now, if you want to apply the major scale, you have to take the whole chord progression into consideration. G, C, and D fit together in the G major scale. They are chords 1, 4, and 5. So you could play the G major scale over all of the chord changes. Whoops. And it'll fit over the chord changes. Now, the reason why I wanted to point that out 
Let's say you had a song that used the chords G, F, and C, you know? Something like that. Um, again, the G is your primary chord, so you could play G major pentatonic over the whole progression. But you wouldn't want to play the G major scale. These three chords don't all fit into the G major scale. G, F, and C are actually the three major chords from the C major scale. So you want to play C major scale patterns. Uh, over this song, C major scale's got the F natural, which is where the F natural chord comes from. G major has the F sharp. That's going to clash with this. This is actually a mode here. You're, you're playing the C major scale, but you're focusing on the fifth degree uh, G. Makes G mixolydian mode. But anyway, pentatonic, as a general rule, pentatonic will follow your main primary chord, and you can play it over the whole progression. But for the major scale, you need to figure out which uh, scale the all the chords in the progression fit into together. If there is no, if you, if there is not one scale that all the chords fit into together, then you have something else going on. And I talk more about that in like fretboard theory volume two, and I won't get into those details now. But one final thing I will mention is that <clears throat> in some cases you might want to change scales over chords. So let's say I'm playing a song that uses the chords C and F. So I could play the C major pentatonic, you know, over the whole progression, or I could play the uh, C, major, uh, C major scale. Or I could actually Another option is I could change scales to follow the chord. So I could play C major pentatonic over the C chord, right? And then when it goes to the F chord, I could switch scale patterns and play the F major pentatonic. One example of this is My Girl by the Temptations. That riff that you hear at the beginning is C major pentatonic over the C chord and F major pentatonic over the F chord. So there's a real simple and recognizable example of how you would actually change scales uh, over chords. So there is an answer to the question in a nutshell about applying scales. And of course, um, I talk a lot more about this in the fretboard theory series, but we're going to move on. OK, <clears throat> next question here comes from Jared. Um, and he says that he's been playing a Gibson Les Paul guitar for years. He says he's at an intermediate level, and he wants to get another guitar. He's debating between the Fender Stratocaster, the Made in Mexico Player Series guitar, which is only six seventy nine. He says, uh, or he was interested in the PRS Silver Sky, which is uh, significantly more. It's it's like over two grand. Uh, you probably find a used one for less than that. And he says, would you recommend starting with the Fender, which is kind of considered a better uh, more affordable buy, or should I go with the PRS? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, there's a little bit more to that there, so I'm just giving you the gist of it. Yeah, so uh, here's the deal. It all depends on your budget, you know. Um, I mean, I have some students where dropping 700 bucks or dropping $2,000 is nothing to them because, you know, they're very successful and they have the money, and so it's not a big deal to them, in which case I say, you know, just purchase whatever you would are excited about, you know? It's a gift to yourself of whatever you're going to be motivated to play. I would say that, um, you know, the PRS guitar is more expensive for a reason. Uh, I PRS actually loaned me a Silver Sky temporarily. I got to play one. I thought it was fantastic. I really did. Um, Super high quality, really comfortable to play. I really liked the pickups on it. They were stratty and glassy, but they were voiced so, so that they were very usable. And um, oftentimes with Stratocaster type guitars, sometimes they're just too troubly, too ice picky, and um, too difficult to use for that reason, just because the sound is uh, a, a little hard uh, to deal with. I thought the Silver Sky was really well done. So, you know, it's going to be a better guitar. However, 
a lot of the less expensive options that are on the market right now, like the Made in Mexico uh, Fender, that, uh, or uh, PRS brand has the SE uh, guitars that are made overseas. There's I've got a couple of them behind me, actually, here, behind this backdrop. Um, they're actually very good guitar for the money. So even though technically the Silver Sky is better, yeah, you know, you got to ask yourself, do I really need better? You know what I mean? It's like, do you really need to buy, you know, a sixty, a fifty or sixty thousand dollar car? I mean, a, a thirty thousand dollar car is can still be great. Um, it's up to you. You know, you have to just decide what your what your budget is. Um, in terms of if if your main priority is you just want a good sound and you just want to play play music and sound good, either one. You can make that made in Mexico guitar sound good. There's a lot of players, including pro players, that play uh, less expensive models. You know, sometimes they might uh, make a few changes, up, upgrade the pickups. They might throw in another, you know, 150, 200 bucks for some new pickups or something like that. But uh, either one's going to be fine. You just got to determine how much money you want to spend, how important it is, you know, uh, to you. Um, either one of those guitars is going to work fine and give you plenty to work with if your if your ultimate goal is you just you just want to uh, play. Okay, oh, moving on. Next question: What kind of patterns and licks can I use with the minor pentatonic scale? I have learned the five shapes, uh, but I'm struggling to find good licks or patterns. I'm not recognizing patterns or licks in the music that I'm listening to. Right, okay, so the pentatonic scale is like one of the most widely used scales for playing riffs and uh, solos and that sort of thing in uh, rock music. And when you learn the scale, you know, the notes are scattered all over the fretboard and they make patterns. And so what you do is you just kind of learn how to cover the whole fretboard, you know, with a particular scale like E minor pentatonic in, in this position. <laughs> and it makes a particular pattern. Then you learn how to play the same scale, the same notes in the next position. It makes a different pattern. And so on. And as you learn these patterns, what you're basically doing is you're moving up the fretboard and you're just touching on all of the scale tones, you know, and where they are located on, on the fretboard. This, the patterns don't make different scales. You know, I can play E minor pentatonic scale patterns all over the fretboard. It's all the same five notes. It's just those notes located in different positions or in different octaves, different uh, uh, registers. So you learn the scale by just learning what these patterns, how these patterns are played on the fretboard, kind of mapping things out. And then the next step, and the most important step is, you want to learn song parts that use the pattern. So go learn a bunch of E minor pentatonic riffs and some E minor pentatonic solos. So for example, you know, think Back in Black by ACDC, right? Right? So that's using E minor pentatonic. Or think, you know, Suzy Q by CCR, you know? That's E minor pentatonic, or Purple Haze by, you know, Jimi Hendrix. That's E minor pentatonic, or Hey Joe by Jimi Hendrix. That's E minor pentatonic. So if you are a student of my fretboard theory system, you know that whenever I teach you something, I always have a list of songs. And if you have the whole video pro pack, I give you resources with links and you can go follow those links to see some tabs or listen to the songs. Or um, uh, in some cases, I actually have a, a short lesson where I'll, where I'll show you that portion of the song that I'm referencing. And the whole point of that is so that you can take what you're learning, like pentatonic scale patterns, and you can begin to use it by playing something familiar. And as your, vo as, you, as your repertoire of songs grow that use the minor pentatonic, your vocabulary of licks and phrases go, uh, grows. You, you will learn how to use the scale by playing song parts. That's how everybody learns. That's how all your favorite guitarists learn. That's how Jimmy Page learned. And that's how Jimi Hendrix learned. And that's how Eric Clapton learned. They put on records. They, they learned from people that inspired them. They learned their songs. And they started to build a vocabulary of licks and phrases. And eventually, 
over time, they were able to develop their own style. So you can't go from just learning the patterns to playing and improvising in your own style with all these wonderful ideas and skip over the most important part of that process, which is build a vocabulary by learning songs. That's why I reference so many songs in my fretboard theory uh, system, and you don't want to uh, skip that step. You can sign up for a course. Um, I have a free course. If you go to my homepage, guitarmusictheory.com, I ask you some questions about your playing, and one of the answers is you want to learn more about guitar soloing. If you click on that, I have a free mini course called How to Guitar Solo and Play Beyond Scales where I demonstrate more of what I talked about uh, here. So you can go check that out. All right, next question. How long would you advise someone to wait before playing publicly uh, in terms of time or abilities? Um, this, comes from, uh, this comes from Courtney. Yeah, okay. So I don't know that there's like a set length of time um, and it depends on where you're playing publicly, you know? I mean, if you just want to play at your local coffee shop and just sing some songs and strum some, you know, basic chords, then as soon as you have those songs down and, you know, you have enough songs to fill in the time that you're going to be there, if they say, yeah, come on down and play some songs for an hour, well, as soon as you have an hour worth of songs and you can play the basic chords and sing them uh, or whatever you're going to do, then I guess you're... Uh, um, you're ready to go, you know, um, and yeah, that's the, you know, if you want, if you're trying to play like in a cover band or something, um, and you want to play down at the local bar or something like that, usually you need. Uh, well, back back in my day when I used to do that, we would typically play about forty to forty-five songs in a night. We'd play three one-hour sets, so um, you'd have to get that amount of material down and be able to play it. Um, you know, wh it, whether you're just playing the rhythm guitar or you're playing the rhythm and some riffs and leads or whatever. So it, set a goal. Say, all right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, you know, this is what I'm going to play publicly. And uh, this is what I need to get down in order to do that and work through the list. I would say keep it simple. Um, when my first gigs, I would just play with a friend and we would just jam in coffee shops. We didn't sing or anything. And... Uh, one of us would play some chords and one of us would play some melody and we would just do like some Beatles and blues stuff. And then I used to play uh, fingerstyle guitar because <clears throat> I was into that, playing like instrumental stuff. And I think once I had enough material to fill a few hours, I started playing at coffee shops, you know. And then from there, once I had enough material where I could play with a cover band and I knew like, you know, 40, 45, 50 songs, I started playing in, in bands. So... Um, I hope that answers your question. Moving on, Eddie asks, what type of setup should I have for an acoustic guitar when I'm playing and singing solo? Uh, should I use any specific pedals for the guitar, and is there a way to, uh, is there a special setup for the mic I use to sing? And then his second question is, which basic pedals do you recommend for electric guitar? Okay, um, so... If you're going to be performing with uh, like a solo set and, you s and singing, so you're just going to need a microphone and you're going to need to somehow amplify your acoustic guitar. So I'm assuming you're using an acoustic electric guitar that's got a pickup in it. So you just need a little PA system and you plug in the microphone and you plug in the acoustic guitar and you turn them up and mix them and sing and play and you're ready to go. Um, <clears throat> in some cases, you could use like an amp and like an acoustic guitar amp that's made for that purpose, like Fishman have some amps, and uh, you can plug in an acoustic guitar, and you can plug in a microphone. And it might have some basic effects, like maybe you could add a little bit of reverb or something, just so your guitar and your voice don't sound so dry, and you just turn them up and you start singing. Um, it, I mean, in terms of any special setup, sometimes um, uh, when you plug in an acoustic electric directly into a PA system, just because the nature of the electronics and what you're doing, it can sometimes sound a little brittle and it, you know, it doesn't have a natural acoustic sound to it. Um, that can still work well in a lot of live situations. So some people would buy a, um, like a, a, a specific DI box that stands for direct, uh, what is it? Direct input box. Um, 
which basically is something that would go in between the acoustic guitar and your PA system to maybe breathe a little bit more uh, life into it. And boy, if I had thought ahead, I would would have had one on hand to, sh to show you, uh, but I don't. So you can just go to like Sweetwater Guitar Center or something like that and just search, you know, Acoustic DI box, capital D, capital I. And some of them, I believe, just um, work on changing the impedance so you can go from like quarter inch into a DI box and you can come out with an XLR microphone and you could run it to a PA system if you didn't have a quarter inch on your PA or if you were going to plug into a snake and then it was going to go to a front of house mixer far away from the stage, something like that. But there are some DI boxes that have some special features for acoustic guitar that just give you a little bit more control over the sound. I use what's called the Fishman uh, Aura Spectrum. And it has, some, uh, it has some stuff built into it, so it kind of breathes a little bit of natural acoustic guitar life back into the signal, so, it's, so it sounds a little bit more... Um, natural. But I played for years, did tons of gigs where I would just go acoustic straight to the PA with a microphone, a little bit of reverb, and that's all you need. What basic pedals do you need for electric guitar? I mean, it depends on what style you're playing and, and uh, what you want to do. The most common effects that you hear in music are um, overdrive and distortion. Overdrive distortion are, are, you know, similar. Think of overdrive as kind of a lighter distortion and just distortion is kind of a heavier uh, you know sound um, so one or both of those and then uh, reverb and delay there's the most common gu guitar effects the most basic thing I need to do an electric guitar gig are overdrive uh, distortion um, some reverb and some delay and then I would adjust those for different sounds so if I'm you know um, going to play a guitar solo, then I would add overdrive or add distortion just so I get a thicker sound with more sustain. Um, and I'd probably turn up the delay just to give it more more depth and everything. And if I'm just playing a rhythm guitar part, I'm, it just might be clean or it might be clean with a little bit of overdrive or a little bit of distortion for the rhythm guitar parts. And guitar players just set it up. So usually what they have is they have their clean sound, and then they have like a couple stages of overdrive, like stage one, stage two, stage three. So you might have clean, you know, breakup, uh, you know, um, you know, crunchy rhythm guitar sound, and then your lead sound or something, uh, something like that. So okay, moving on. Uh, Kim here asks a couple different qu questions. Uh, practicing with a metronome, I often lose track of the click. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they're asking, how can you improve your time, basically, and follow the click? And wanting some advice on strumming, making advice with strumming. And when should you start to study theory? Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm assuming that you're still kind of in that beginner level, and you're trying to get all those basic skills together, and so you're probably struggling um, you know, you know some basic chords, you know how to strum, but when you start playing with a click, um, it's difficult for you to, to um, stay on, on track. I usually re recommend that <coughs> beginners work on strumming along with simple songs, right? And I have some instruction to give you ideas of how to do that and uh, show you how to do that. When you're playing along with a song and there's more instrumentation there, and uh, that usually makes it a little easier for you to follow, particularly if there's vocals too. Most people just find that a little easier um, to follow. Sometimes it can be kind of challenging playing along with just a click when there's nothing else going on. Um, so particularly if it's, a, if it's a slower tempo song, you've got all this space in between these clicks and it's easy for you to get off. So I usually recommend that you actually play along with music so you can hear the full drum beat and the bass line and and you can hear the guitar in the song as well um, so i would work toward doing that and do that with dozens of songs dozens of songs that's what i instruct people to do uh, play along with songs pick simple songs that are uh, um, are not complicated um, only use you know a handful of basic chords the chords don't change too frequently or anything like that pick songs that don't have any crazy 
you know, rhythm or strum pattern or just pick something that's, that's uh, uh, super simple. Um, I'll send out, when, when I uh, email out um, th uh, a uh, link to this video and this podcast episode and let you know that this is available, I'm going to include a bunch of licks of stuff, uh, links of stuff that I reference here. Uh, so one of them will be, hey, if you're still trying to learn songs and get your essential skills in order, here's what I recommend. So you can um, um, take a look at that. Was there another part to this? Yes, yeah, strumming, same thing. Work on as many simple songs as you can and learn how to strum simply with a lot of different songs and then gradually work on songs that's, that uh, would be just a little bit more challenging. Don't get ahead of yourself. Work on those fundamental skills on simple songs. When should you work on applying theory? After you have no trouble playing complete songs with open chords, power chords, and bar chords, you can play dozens of songs beginning to end. You could go out and see a band, and if they said, hey, we're going to play Brown Eyed Girl, you want to come up here and strum along? If you say, oh, yeah, I can do that, no problem. Then you're ready to start studying music theory, okay? All right, moving on. Uh, Will says that when he plays an amp in real life, it sounds amazing. But digital sounds, but digital sounds like rubbish. So what is he doing wrong? Any any tips? Well, um, <clears throat> digital sounds like uh, rubbish. Listening to a real amp and a digital, and listening to a digital amp, there's a couple things that would make it a different experience uh, for you. First of all. In this day and age, many of the sounds that you hear in recorded music and even in a lot of live situation is digital and you would never know it, right? But when you're sitting at home and you have an amp and you, you know, crank it up and add some reverb and maybe put some overdrive or something in front of it and you play that and then if you turn on a digital device and put it through, um, well, you know, it depends on what you're putting it through. You're putting it through an amp or some studio monitors or some headphones. It can sound very um, uh, synthetic and unnatural uh, <clears throat> and unpleasant if it's not a very good digital device and if you don't really have it set up, <clears throat> set up properly. So I'm playing through a Kemper Profiler uh, amplifier here. <laughs> And I don't care what anybody says, there is nobody in the world that uh, would be able to tell the difference between what you just heard right there and what you would just heard if I had that actual amp that this is profiling mic'd up in the other room. It's the same, it's virtually the same. That's how the Kemper technology works. I got a video on that. <clears throat> See that uh, previous uh, video and I explained a little bit about that. So <clears throat> the Kemper sounds fantastic um, because I have a really well, because it's top of the line digital device, I have a really well-made profile that was actually profiled from a real amp in the studio. And I've added some delay and some reverb to uh, give it some ambiance so it's not dry and to kind of breathe some life into it. <laughs> So I have it set up so it sounds very natural and very uh, amp amp like. Um, but if you were playing with a device and you didn't have a set, like here, if I take the effects off, here's just the dry amp. So all of a sudden, it's like, well, yeah, it kind of, you know, it, it's it's lost a little bit of its um, um, of its of its sound, right? Now, when you're playing an amp in a room. You're not just hearing the amp, you're hearing the room too. So even if you don't have any effects on your amp and you turn it up, you're hearing room noise and you're hearing the, the sound waves bounce around the room. And that's part of what makes uh, that, ex that experience of standing in front of an amp what it is, is that you're, you're hearing the movement and you're, and you're hearing the room, right? So I actually, on my Kemper here, here it is dry, check this out, I added a really fast slap back delay. Listen to this. This is without it. 
here's with it. Might need to have some headphones on to hear this clearly. That really short slapback delay adds, it kind of gives the impression that there's, I'm sitting in a room a little bit. And then I add reverb on top of it. Now it sounds like I'm, I'm in like a small hall or something. Oops. So um, if you're playing a digital device, you want to make sure that you are setting it up so that you create a sound similar to what you experience if you have a real amp. You've got to have, well, you've got to start with a good, a good signal. So it has to be a good di digital device. Um, but then you need to add usually a little bit of reverb and some, some delay, something to give it some depth and to kind of breathe some life into it. Make sure you're listening with a good pair of headphones too. When I record and play and practice, I have a, a good pair of over-the-ear headphones. Music sounds fantastic through them, and so does uh, my amp. But I've used, I've used um, less expensive digital things like Sans Amp and some Line 6 stuff. And when I get things dialed in, it can, it can sound good. You just kind of have to know uh, um, what you're doing. Now, if you're trying to compare a real amp to, say, some of the... Uh, cheapest digital amps like you know a $99 digital practice amp or something like that um, again you have to know what you're doing dial it in to see if you can get the best sound but sometimes hey if you only spent if you didn't spend much on it well you, you can't expect it to sound like something you know more expensive so you might want to try some different uh, 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 di digital things but I think that maybe the 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 main thing people have to get over if they're using digital is you're not you're no longer hearing the amp in the room sound and some people are so used to that that when they go to digital and that's gone it sounds very strange so you got to work with the sound a little bit in order to kind of uh, uh, recreate that um, there's more I could say on that but I hope that um, we got to move on because I got a lot of questions here okay next question what are some good ways to connect the five pentatonic patterns so that I can solo with more options as I move up and down the scale? Um, the other question is how to play the scales with the cage system. Um, I'm trying to learn how to play a melody along with the chords I'm playing. For example, using the C scale with the different yada, yada, yada. Okay. Uh, so there, okay, I think, what are some good ways to connect the patterns? I think the answer to this goes back to what I said earlier. When you learn um, <clears throat> the pentatonic patterns, that's the first step. But then you have to build a vocabulary by, building, by learning songs and building a song repertoire. When you learn a bunch of riffs and solos and melodies that use the pentatonic, then you see how other players use them melodically and how they shift positions and all that. That's going to show you what you need to do. Build that vocabulary, and you'll start using the patterns in the way I think you want to use them. Um, in terms of connecting them with the uh, cage system, well, let me talk about the cage system for a moment there. You know, that is, first and foremost, uh, um, the way that chord shapes are naturally built on the fretboard, you know. So you learn it as a uh, chord system. That's how I teach it in fretboard theory. And you learn all the different ways that you can make uh, chord shapes. And then I reference lots of popular songs. And I show you how you can you use those chord shapes to play um, it, you know, different, different songs. And get a variety of sound with all these different chord voicings and, and uh, uh, that sort of thing. In terms of connecting the scales with the cage uh, chord forms, you can do that. You can go through each position and say, well, here is you know, this, a C chord in this caged form. Oh, and in the same position, I could also play you know, C major pentatonic pattern, whatever, or C major scale pattern, uh, whatever. And I do uh, introduce that idea to you in uh, um, fretboard theory and some people consider that to be part of the whole cage system on the whole when they when they say that they're referring to the chord shapes and scale patterns and kind of putting it all together and viewing it all together and that is very useful 
Um, it's one way to map out the fretboard, and uh, I do talk about that a little bit uh, in fretboard theory. Um, but um, it's not a it's a system you want to be familiar with, but it's not something you need to be completely married to. You can use it if it works for you. If you want to move out of those positions, or if you want to play different scale patterns, you can do that too. I'll talk about that in fretboard theory, is as well. Uh, finally, this is from John, and he's uh, finally this is this three-parter here. Uh, he says the other goal I'm working on is to develop my musical ear. For example, I've been playing around with playing a simple tune, starting in various positions in different keys, play a few notes, get to the point where I can intuitively play the melody at a point on the fretboard. I know it will take time. Let me know if you have some tips on developing a musical and intuitive ear. I got a video on this that I released previously. You might want to check that out. And so I'll just kind of sum it up here. Um, <clears throat> I did not develop my ear by doing ear training exercises. I develop, developed my ear by learning and performing lots of songs and by mapping things out on the fretboard and finding ways to understand what I was doing and make connections between the parts that I was playing. So, you know, I played in bands for years. You know, most people consider, consider my ear to be a good one because I can hear a song in the radio and with my guitar in hand, I can figure it out uh, very quickly. In some cases, before I even touch the guitar, I can say, I know that's the key of E, that's E, A, and B, and that riff that they played was a descending E major scale or something like that. Sometimes I'll hear something in a song and I recognize it, not because of any ear training exercise I did, but because I recognize that what's in the music is something I have played over and over and over in countless songs, right? If you learn Brown Eyed Girl, And if, like me, you've played that song literally thousands of times cause in, in cover bands, because I played in bands for years, and that was always one of the most popular songs. So I've played that song so many times. When I, whenever I hear any new song on the radio that plays up a major scale and thirds like that, even if it's in a different key, maybe it's in the key of uh, D, right? of C. When I hear that sort that sort of movement, you know, I immediately think, oh gosh, I played Brown Eyed Girl thousands of times, same sort of thing. So I already have an idea of how to play that. And I just need to pick up my guitar and figure out, is it in the key of G or is it in a different key? And uh, it just takes me a second to uh, figure it out. And boom, um, I have it. So I personally think that the best way to train your ear, learn to learn and perform a bunch of songs because that's what's really going to make it stick. And then I would also add, um, I do think that some amount of theory helps too, particularly the kind of theory that I teach in the fretboard theory system because it's real practical stuff and it's all um, uh, connected to, famili to familiar songs. So when I hear this sound... I not only recognize that that's what I play in Brown Eyed Girl, but I also know that that's climbing up the major scale in thirds. So I have a little bit of theory, uh, theory there too. But having a good ear is not just about your ear. It is about your playing experience. It's actually about you recognizing what you have played many times before. I hope that helps. Moving on. Uh, this is from uh, this is from Glenn. Uh, Glenn's a Skype student of mine. I would be interested in learning the specifics of your signal path when recording your videos into your DAW, and then how do you sync with your video? DAW stands for Digital Audio Workstation. Yeah, my setup is pretty simple. So whenever you watch my videos, um, I uh, I mic myself up, and then my guitars. Everything goes into a little mixer. It's an eight-channel Alesis mixer. 
So I plug in my vocal mic and my uh, electric guitar, my acoustic guitar, and whatever, you know, some audio, whatever I'm going to use in the lesson. And then I use a really inexpensive USB um, interface, come out of the mixer, uh, RCA outs, into that uh, USB interface, into the back of my computer, into Gar GarageBand. I'm using an Apple iMac. I don't use any fancy schman. Well, I guess the mixer is a decent quality eight channel mixer, but um, I don't even use like an expensive audio interface. I don't need it. I just use a cheap USB one um, directly into GarageBand. Um, I, and everything is recorded in one stereo track um, that I have my video cameras. I uh, uh, put, ev I sync everything together in Final Cut Pro. So I um, import the video when I'm done import the audio that was rec that's being recorded right now. It's being recorded in front of me on GarageBand. Uh, sync them up in, in Final Cut Pro using the, uh, you know, you, well, I, I usually have two, um, two cameras. I have a wide shot, and then I have like a close shot. You see, you know, my hands up close like this. I don't have the second camera on right now. And I just, uh, I make a multi-cam clip out of those so I can toggle back and forth between those two angles. And then I take that multi-cam clip and I synchronize it with the audio, and then I mute the audio and from the, the camera audio. I don't want that. I just want the recorded audio from, uh, uh, from GarageBand. And then Final Cut, Cut Pro has an option where you can click uh, on the audio track, and you can click loudness, and I think it just kind of normalizes and maximizes uh, the sound. That's it. And if you know anything about audio and video production, you know that that's as, as simple as you can get right there. Um, the electric guitar is going through a Kemper profiler, profiler amplifier, and if I'm playing acoustic, that goes through it uh, as well, and that's what's producing my uh, amp sounds. And actually, Glenn had another question. Could you review some right-hand picking techniques, specifically what angle do you hold the pick in relation to the strings, and what picks have you been using lately? Um, I have a program called Guitar Picking Mechanics where I talk about just that sort of thing. And um, I go over, over some basics and then I get into what I would consider to be more advanced picking skills, um, alternate picking skills. It's kind of, it's kind of a mixture. I, I didn't want the program to be you know, how to shred like Ingve Malmsteen because there's already stuff like that on the market and because that sort of stuff is really overkill for most players. Most players don't need to learn how to shred like Ingve Malmsteen. Most players are kind of just struggling with their picking on um, more on just ordinary typical music, right? And so I wanted to, it, it, it kind of covers maybe like intermediate to early advanced level picking. Um, and of course, True to my style, I reference a lot of familiar songs. You know, how would you pick through, you know, the solo in Stairway to Heaven? Or how would you pick the introduction to Sweet Home Alabama? That sort of thing. That's what most people um, are playing. So I wanted to focus on that. And if your goal is that you want to get into more advanced picking techniques, shredding techniques, well, you better have those other skills in order first. You can't skip over those and go straight to picking like, you know, uh, Ingve, Ingve Malmsteen. So um, you could complete a, my guitar picking mechanics course, and that would be a good, uh, you know, preparation to move on to something more, uh, more difficult. And I don't teach anything more difficult because I would never use techniques beyond what's in uh, guitar picking mechanics. Um, there are some shred techniques, but I don't just I just don't go very far uh, with them. But anyway, couple answers here. So uh, the main picks that I have been using lately, this is just a plain Fender Heavy. Um, and I like this on uh, like acoustic guitar sometimes. I like it on humbucker guitars. And this is a, a gravity guitar pick. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this or not. How about if I do this? I hold it up like that. Yeah, it's red. It's kind of translucent. It's the G JHS logoed gravity guitar pick. It's made out of some sort of, what is it, an acrylic material or something? And uh, it's, this is much thicker and uh, sturdier. And I like the feel of that. And I like the way it sounds on my Strat here. 
Whoops. Ja. I don't like the way it sounds on my humbucker guitar. I feel like it uh, it's just uh, too it snaps the string too much and I don't like the way it sounds. And I'm probably fussing about this and I shouldn't um, fuss about this. So I like the way this sounds on my humbucker guitars more. I don't like the way this feels as much because uh, although this is a heavy pick, um, it's not quite as sturdy as the uh, gravity pick. And I like a really sturdy pick, but a real sturdy pick doesn't always sound good. And m usually my preference is, with most things, is do, I want it to sound good. I want to, I want to like the tone. Um, I talk about this in my guitar picking mechanics course too. If you're going to be working on playing stuff that requires a lot of alternate picking, you want a sturdier pick. It, you know, it definitely, um, um, it definitely helps. So I like to, I like to just try different things. I've actually got uh, a variety of picks that are sitting out here, off camera, in front of me. And um, depending on the guitar I'm playing, depending on whether it's acoustic or electric, I kind of change picks depending on what I think sounds or feels best. And maybe some of that's all in my head. Um, but uh, next, you know you can you can experiment with this. Get some different picks from with some different um, thicknesses and different materials, and um, get an acoustic guitar or something or an electric guitar. Um, I think I started to notice this more on acoustic guitar. Um, I was reading an article years ago by David Grissom, and he said that he would always bring a variety of picks to him to a recording session depending on the sound they needed. And I don't know, it kind of struck me because I was like. I never really thought about the sound that a pick would make. You know, for all the time that I was playing, it was always how did it feel and how sturdy was it, you know? Um, how responsive was it or, you know, whatever. But I, it kind of intrigued me. And I think he was talking specifically about acoustic guitar. And so I went out and got a variety of picks and I just started strumming my acoustic guitar and doing different stuff and just listening to it. And I was like, oh my gosh, by golly, the tone can get a little brighter or a little darker depending on the thickness of the pick and the material. And it just kind of opened up a whole new world to me. Like, how did I overlook that for, for so long? So I go, when I choose a pick, I always pay attention to how it feels, but also how does it sound as well? So that's all I'm going to say about that. Let's move on. This next question comes from Charles. He says, my question is, if I want to learn a few different styles of playing, such as acoustic finger picking, playing rock and blues solos, learning songs, is it better to focus on one style for a few weeks or, or months in my practice sessions or practice each style in every practice session? In other words, should my practice focus should my practice time focus on one thing, or can I practice multiple things in each uh, session? Um, yeah. So Charles, I'm going to assume that you're still in that kind of what I consider beginner stage. You've learned the basics, but now you're really focusing on applying those basics and actually playing music for for uh, for real. Um, and I would say the first thing you want to do is focus on playing complete songs and keep them simple and make sure that there isn't anything complicated or difficult about the technique, uh, about the te needed techniques. So, you know, I always recommend that uh, after players learn the basics to, um, you know, learn 10 songs, simple songs that use open chords, right? <laughs> Learn how to play 10 songs all the way through completely. Simple open chords, simple strum patterns. Then do the same thing with power chords. Um, and then do the same thing uh, with bar chords. And that's going to be quite a chore. And it's going to take a lot of work even when you're dealing with what I would consider to be simple songs. In other words, you don't have more than, you know, maybe a few or a handful of chords. There isn't anything terribly difficult, difficult about the rhythm or the strumming. It's really just a matter of you uh, 
playing in time with the music and keeping up with the chord changes, even though the chords are not changing too often. So I would say, if you're still on that stage, focus on that. Don't worry about techniques. If you're getting ahead of, your, of yourself. If you say, well, but I want to learn some fingerstyle technique like Chet Atkins, or I want to learn some slide guitar technique like Dwayne Allman or something like that, you're getting way ahead of yourself. Um, you need to work on those basics that every guitar player, you know, whether you're um, Eric Clapton or Bonnie Raitt or Chet Atkins or whatever, fill in the blank with some guitar player who has styles and technique that you admire. No matter who they are, any one of them can pick up their guitar and strum basic songs, and strum basic chords along with the song. That is fundamental, foundational technique that everyone has to learn. So work on that. And then, you know, once you can do that, you can say, you know what? I think I want to focus on fingerstyle guitar now. You know, you'll have the skills where now you're ready to take things a little bit further. And, you know, maybe you work on Dust in the Wind and Blackbird and Stairway to Heaven or something like that. And you can work on uh, finger picking. But before you venture into those techniques, make sure you have uh, essential skills. I have um, a course that I sell that's called Essential Skills, and I kind of walk you through that stuff. And I named it that because I'm like, look, you have to have these skills no matter what you're attempting to play. You have to have these. They are essential. Um, and a lot of people, you know, sometimes I recommend that. People are like, nah, I don't want to learn those songs. I want to learn how to play this, you know, this Almond Brothers stuff. And I'm like, look, you can't, you can't skip this and get to where you want to be. you got to learn you got to get these essential skills in order. All right, moving on. Next question. I would really like to learn some techniques for developing a clean sound without noise from other strings and finger movement. Okay, this, this uh, is related to what I just finished with. Understanding how to finger your chords cleanly, how to mute um, unused strings, and that sort of thing, that's all part of essential skills. And you develop that by playing songs, simple songs. I talk about that stuff all throughout some of my lessons that's geared towards people at that level. You know, how when you play power chords and stuff, you know. Uh, how can you get those specific notes that you're fretting to ring clearly, and then how, to, how do you silence the other strings while you're strumming? I talk about that sort of technique. I talk about how to, um, how to play, play cleanly, how to have smooth transitions between your chords. This is all basic stuff, and you work this stuff out while you're playing songs. Don't get ahead of yourself. Play simple songs first, lots of them, and slowly over time add songs that are just a little bit more challenging and a little bit more challenging. If you try to take too big of a leap, um, you're just going to have something that's just beyond your ability and you're, you're going to struggle and you're not going to make progress. Back up, work on something simpler. Next question, what is the best way to learn modes and their application? This is going to sound like a sales pitch, but this is the best answer I can get you, give you. Get the Fretboard Theory Video Pro Pack. Chapter 8 and Level 1, I dedicate to modes. And then once you're introduced to the concept, um, I, uh, of course, it comes up in conversation as you continue through the course and get into other things. And you're actually introduced to things that you need to know uh, about modes prior to Chapter 8. I just... Uh, I, I don't tell you their modes until uh, chapter eight. I should say this. Um, one of the reasons why people get so confused about modes is because they've gotten ahead of themselves. Modes is a concept that involves other things. Specifically, you have to understand the major scale construction, how the major scale notes are stacked to make triads and chords, and how you get that numbered sequence, the harmonized major scale, you know, the one, two, six, seven. All of that is, that's like some of the most important uh, theory stuff that you need to know regardless of which topic you're trying to understand. But you will not understand modes 
until you first understand that. So in fretboard theory, I introduce major scale patterns in chapter five. And then in chapter six, I show you how to take the notes from major scales, build chords from them, triads, and uh, create the harmonized major scale. That's, and, and how to play by number. We talk, I talk about chord progressions and how to play by number numbers. You have to understand that first. Then I'll talk about how you get modes out of that. And then, like I said a moment ago, uh, after modes is introduced, they come up again and again because as you get into more advanced theory, modes are often at play there as well. So that's what I recommend. We have hit the one hour mark here. So what I'm going to do is uh, wrap this up and I'm going to release this in uh, segments. I got a lot more questions to get through. So we have finished part one and if you're watching this video on YouTube, I would ask you to subscribe so you can get notifications when new videos are released. If uh, you enjoyed this video, click like. Um, if you uh, have some more questions, you can email me or you can just, if you're watching on YouTube, just post it in the comments below. If you have anything to add to this conversation that you think might be helpful for um, uh, viewers, go ahead and uh, leave me some comments below. If you're listening to the podcast, um, you know, make sure you're subscribing to it. Um, leave me a good rating. And uh, if you have questions, you can uh, <clears throat> email them to me. So I'm going to set out, send out an email uh, and I will have some links to some of the different uh, the things that I have uh, uh, mentioned throughout this. So you could take a closer look at some of the free courses I have or some of the paid courses I have. But if you are not on my email list and you are not currently receiving emails um, about guitar and music and stuff going on in uh, my world, head over to guitarmusictheory.com. I'll ask you a question about your playing and then you'll see some different answers that you can select. Select the answer that best describes you and I will get you hooked up with some free instruction and you'll also get uh, subscribed to my email list so you get notified anytime um, I release a new video or blog post or podcast episode or I have news to share. And uh, the next time I might ask you to send some questions. So why don't you do that? We're going to wrap up this first part of the Q&A. Stay tuned because I will, wa ah, I will release part two shortly.